Okay, so let's begin. And hello, everyone. Uh, for those who do not know me, I'm Andres Unikas from Operational Marketing Department. And today we have, let's say, a special day. Uh, well, every time when we are hosting a webinar, it's a special day, at least for me. Uh, but today is even more special day since you are going to see our cybersecurity specialist from Teltonica Networks, who will share his insights about cyber attack preventions. And his name is David Svichnauskas. Also, we are having Prana Saksametauskas today as a speaker. We will be introducing a special topic, Secure Boot. Well, and what's special about me? Basically nothing. Probably all of you are bored of me, so for the next webinar, I promise that uh, I will not be the host. Uh, I will pass my word to my colleagues, either Pranas, Thomas, or Tada Zelitinskas. Uh, so today, four billion dollars. Why am why am I starting this webinar, this topic, with a number like four thousand million or four billion US dollars? Because it's the most expensive security breach of all times. In 2011. Hackers hit Epsilon, a company called Epsilon, and managed to steal an unknown number of names and emails affecting companies such as Best Buy, JP Morgan, Target, and others. 700 million US dollars, the second place of the most expensive security breaches, and the company which suffered is called Equifax, a credit monitoring giant. Imagine companies in financial sector even suffers from hackers. What is also important that this company is a public one, and public one means it is listed on the stock exchange. And that day when the breach happened, Wall Street lowered the company's valuation by 4 billion US dollars. Well, again, 4 billion. Going further with another one, 470 million US dollars. This happened to Yahoo. I do not know if someone from you remembers this hack, but I do, since I was using an e Yahoo email. After that breach, everyone, the whole database received emails insisting to change password of your account. And lastly, the last number is that according to IBM, the average cost of data breach in 2021, this year, was exceeding 4 million US dollars. And why am I talking about data breaches? Because it is an essential piece of the whole security mechanism. Even a small piece like a router in internet infrastructure is important. And as you know, hardware is not responsible for the security, but the software is. And our software, our own operating system is called RTOS. It is based on OpenWRT Linux base. Through many years of development, we have managed to make it secure, reliable, and easy to use. So today I will be speaking about one of these parts, the security. And to understand better the security features which we are offering, I would like to begin with internal network security that our operating system is based on. Our web UI communication is based on HTTPS which means it opens an encrypted channel between the router and your laptop, for example. Furthermore, if you would like to reach the router via one IP, you will not be able to do that since our products are using so-called internal network. But you can change this configuration if you need so. Also, when using the, uh, when using the router's Wi-Fi, for example, RTX11 Wi-Fi, devices which are connected to it, to the Wi-Fi, will be separated one from another without a possibility to reach each other. Mandatory password change, it might sound funny or silly, but come on, it is very important. More than 40% of people are not changing the default admin password, and 9 out of 10 attacks comes from having simple credentials. That is why we do not let you to use our devices before you change the password. If you had the chance to go to the web UI of our products when you are, when you are logging in with the default password, uh, everything goes successfully, but after that, you must change the password. If you won't change the password, you will not be able to use the router. So 
just for your imagination, how long it would take to hack your password. I have a table and here you can see that having a password with numbers only means that you're ha not having a password at all. While having a password with numbers, upper and lowercase letters with 10 characters, for example, would take approximately seven months to hack. So please, check your passwords and change them if you have numbers only or lowercase letters only. Another simple but highly important feature of our devices is firewall. With it, you have an unlimited configurations. Also, when we send a product to you, uh, it already has pre-configured rules enabled via Web UI. This saves you from, let's say, a human factor problems, human factor errors, when your IT admin forgets to configure them to be as secure as possible. Also, a few weeks ago, we have updated Firewall to the latest version and included it into RET OS version 7.0. One of the most important things in our operating system by security is that we support different VPN protocols such as OpenVPN, IPsec, DMVPN, and we do not charge additionally for that. Furthermore, if this is not enough for your sec network security, you can easily tell to us what is needed for you. Since our RET OS architecture is flexible, it enables a possibility to adapt to our client needs. Talking about adapting to client needs, we would like to highlight Telnet protocol. Well, we didn't have it a few years ago, but we developed and included it uh, since some of our clients needed this functionality. However, we understood that this is legacy protocol, uh, which is not using any encryption, meaning it is easily accessible from outside and not safe enough. So we disabled it by the default. If you will need it, you can easily activate it manually. Since a variety of tasks can be carried out via SMS in our product, we had, made, we had to make sure that only authorized devices can connect to the router. Therefore, by default, SMS commands will only work if both conditions are met. The SMS number and the router's password are known to each other. Also, there might be an extra layer of, the, of security like authentication with a serial number to a specific phone number or only accepting commands from a list of pre-approved numbers. The web filter service provides you with the possibility to restrict which websites a user can visit on a local network. An administrator can upload blacklists or whitelists that, uh, let's say, are either blocking or allowing specific web, web addresses to be accessed. It is especially useful in hotspots to limit data usage, or let's say, well, in schools and enterprise settings to ensure that only the necessary IP addresses are reachable and the rest of the content is blocked. Let's admit that network connectivity troubleshooting can be a real pain sometimes. TCP dump becomes a life savior in some situations. It is a program used to capture and decode packets moving through network interfaces. TCP dump is a very effective and comprehensive tool with a let's say, variety of options and filters and fits perfectly for running on remote servers or routers. And how not to mention RMS when talking about security in RETOS. RMS is our remote management system, which is a perfect tool to reach our router remotely from any location in the world. To ensure safe communication between RETOS and RMS, we have encrypted the channel with TLS 1.2 certificate, which we renew constantly. And the last thing to mention about security from my side, before I pass my word to my colleagues, is that recently we have updated RT OS to 7.0 version, where we included the latest OpenWRT base, updated kernel and firewall versions, meaning that our products are secure as it can be. And now I pass my word to our cybersecurity specialist, David Asbishnauskas, who will tell you some interesting stories about breaches and how to prevent them. So David, let's take your time. 
Thank you, Andres, and hello, everyone. I will try to keep this uh, brief and interesting for you. I will be introducing some of the complementary attack prevention features in our RUT devices, which are capable of mitigating several types of common attacks. So the first thing on our list is port scan prevention, which from my professional experience is the most common reconnaissance technique on a network. Every successful attack starts somewhere and it almost always starts with a simple port scan for mapping the network. The port scan can reveal critical information about a network to the attacker, which will determine the attack vector of the malicious actor. The mitigation works by monitoring the requests from devices across the network and blocking the devices from any continuous scanning activity. The packet count and the time limit of these requests can be adjusted by the administrator to serve the network's needs, uh, as to not unintentionally block legitimate traffic. Several port scanning techniques are mitigated like uh, TCP Christmas scans, where several uncommon combinations of flags are turned on in the request, making it appear like Christmas tree lights from an analyst's point of view. Then there are fin and scene fin scans, one of the most common types of scans. that are also called stealth scans due to them not completing the TCP freeway handshake. And the uh, null flag scans, packets that contain a sequence number of zeros and uh, no set flags. These can sometimes penetrate firewalls due to their odd uh, settings. The second attack mitigation is the distributed denial of service attack preventions. There are mitigations for scene flooding, ICMP request bursts, and also continuous HTTP and SSH connection initialization attacks. These are uh, different techniques, but they all accomplish the same thing, it is uh, device resource exhaustion. Uh, the way this mitigation works is it limits the amount of connections the router will allow depending on a customizable setting. You can limit the burst amount depending on the packet count and the time period uh, these requests were generated in. If the set limits are reached, uh, the router will not engage in the connections and will start dropping the requests, conserving resources. Uh, this in turn can ease uh, the load on the router, preventing system disruption from resource exhaustion. These triggered events are, of course, logged and can be reviewed by the administrator for further investigation. Throughout my working experience, I have encountered several attackers performing DDoS attacks in the hopes that their attack will disrupt the business operations of the company. Uh, after the first attack, they usually attempt to coerce money from the organization by threatening a second, more serious attack. A lot of the time, the attackers are attempting to bluff their way into easy profit, but there are cases where they are true to their word and continue attacking the network. Uh, blocking high-level DDoS attacks may require more than just a simple feature like proper firewall rules, load balancers, and uh, geo-blocking. The final security feature is uh, a basic one, but an extremely necessary addition, account brute force prevention for both the web UI login page and the SSH interface of the device. The necessity of this feature is due to possible weak passwords that could brute force or be cracked by dictionary attacks. Uh, these attacks contain a large list of predetermined possible passwords, uh, usually from password dumps and breaches, uh, or outright attempts to guess the password one letter and number at a time. The administrator can set the incorrect amount of failed login attempts it will tolerate and will add the device to a block list if uh, the threshold is reached, uh, preventing further interaction with the device. Uh, the limit is customizable, but the default number is 10 attempts. The administrator can remove devices from the block list at any time. The security feature is on by default and events are of course logged for further review. So uh, that is all for the additional security features. A reminder that uh, good network security will certainly boil down to tight firewall rules, network segmentations, and proper usages of VPNs. As such, these security features should only be complementary to a secure network stance. Uh, the next part of this presentation will be continued by Prana Saksimitauskas, our operational marketing project executive here at Teltonica Networks. Thank you. So, Ronald, uh, <clears throat> when you're ready. Oh, thank you, David. Thank you for the great insights and thank you for the introduction. So today I would like to introduce the new security feature that comes to Teltonic and network devices. That's Secure Boot. In our society, connected IoT devices can be found in almost every aspect of our life. Just look around. 
networking connectivity is used everywhere from transportation to medical devices, from kitchen appliances to smartwatches. The amount of generated data and the process controlled by networking devices are growing exponentially. This causes the need for high attention to IoT devices security. And this is why we introduced the new feature, Secure Boot. In my presentation, you will find out what Secure Boot is, how it works, and which devices are compatible. Basic security framework is a trust where everything in the system completely agrees that a certain root point in the system can be trusted and provides a secure foundation for the rest of the system to be securely loaded. To give simple example, we can compare boot process to the construction of a building. To successfully finish the building, we have to be sure that foundations will stand strong and will hold all the other levels. It is very important that all construction team would follow building techniques and use correct materials. When securing IoT devices, the same approach can be adapted. If we want to have our device running securely, the boot process must be assured in the first place. Without that assurance in the first place, anything else cannot be fully trusted. Secure boot is essential to prevent potential harmful third party from compromising an operating system or installing a different bootloader into an IoT device. For example, someone who hacks into a device may find a way to replace an existing executable file with one containing malware. In this case, device without secure boot might reboot at some point and run the harmful code. If this would happen, any function that the device performs cannot be relied as legitimate and trustworthy. However, with a secure boot process in place, the checks at boot time would identify and expose unexpected file and start remedial actions. When secure boot future is present, potentially harmful third parties are no longer able to tamper with the device by loading firmware and approved by manufacturer. Also, it is very important to mention that advanced users are no longer able to adjust or modify the firmware image based on software development key provided by Teltonica networks. So secure boot is a verification mechanism to ensure that only trusted firmware will be launched on the device. Secure boot devices are equipped with hardware root of trust, which contains the keys used for cryptographic functions, and in that way, it enables a secure boot process. Secure boot makes sure that only the authorized manufactured firmware can be booted on the device, and that firmware has not been altered or modified by any malicious third party or process. The secure boot process goes through a series of chain steps to ensure the integrity and authenticity of installation for the device to run in correct and secure way. A secure boot system adds cryptographic checks to each stage of the system boot process. Cryptographic processing verifies the authenticity of all the product software images that are executed by the device. This additional check prevents unauthorized images from running on the router. This way, it secures the router from any unwanted guest loading malicious software versions. So, secure boot process in the first step checks integrity and authenticity of bootloader every boot, then checks integrity and authenticity of firmware every boot, and only after that verified firmware is started. If bootloader integrity is damaged, recovery bootloader with limited functionality is used. If corrupted firmware is detected, it is possible to reinstall it via local network. Secure boot functionality comes to the root 9 series devices. However, it will not become immediately available to all the root 9 series routers. Secure boot requires a specific hardware. Root 9 series devices with secure boot feature can be ordered by following order codes shown on the screen. Once again, I would like to remind that users will not be able to run custom firmware on devices with secure boot feature. For more details regarding ordering, please contact your sales managers. So that's basically all what we wanted to share with you today. Thank you for attendance to our webinar. And also, I want to say thanks for my colleagues, Andrews and Davidus, for the information and insight they shared today.
Okay, thanks, Pranas. Thanks, David, for, for, for your insights. Uh, now we'll try to review some of the questions. Um, if you have additional questions, just write them. We'll try to answer all of them. And I have the first question for Pranas about the secure boot. Uh, will this secure boot uh, is a problem for custom firmware using SDK? I think you mentioned in, in, in the end about the custom, uh, custom firmware. Could, could you tell us the answer? Um, secure the devices with secure boot only can work with the firmware that are built in in manufacturing process. So basically, the firmware have to be uh, confirmed by us and built in the in the devices in manufacturing process. You cannot use the custom firmware on these secure boot devices. Okay, I hope that uh, we have answered this question. Uh, David, as maybe you see some questions that, uh, let's say, um, are oriented to you. Yeah, well, I can see uh, an anonymous attendee asked, uh, can we enable stateful firewall and antivirus features by any chance? So uh, the DDoS and the port scanning preventers is most of what we could call a stateful firewall. There are custom rules that could be made, but we do not have a true stateful firewall. And unfortunately, at the moment, we do not have uh, antivirus features. So, yeah. I also see a second question, is MAC address filtering possible in uh, version seven? And yes, it is possible. Uh, the settings are under wireless settings, wireless security. You can add exclusions, whitelists, blacklists. It works. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, Pranas, do you see additional questions uh, related with your topic with Secure Boot? Uh, I think yes, it's another quite similar question. So, do you mean I can not modify a firmware using SDK? Um, you are still able to modify our firmware, but it cannot be used at the devices with Secure Boot. You can use this modified firmware with another devices that is not present with secure boot functionality. Okay, thanks Pranas. Uh, I just want to repeat that uh, uh, secure boot uh, is uh, in like a, a hardware feature or something like that. Um, so if you want to have a product with secure boot, you uh, must order like a new product which will be different from uh, from the products that you have already. Uh, uh, yes, so Andrews, uh, that I showed in my presentation, there will be two different product order codes and they will be only for a routine 950 and a routine 955. And these devices will be different from other a routine 950 or 955 uh, because of different hardware mounted in, 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 in these devices in manufacturing process. And only by using this different hardware, it would be possible to use secure boot functionality. So secure boot functionality do not come to the root 9 series devices by default, only for that two different order codes. Okay, thanks, Pranas. Uh, do we have additional questions? If yes, uh, just uh, take a minute uh, to answer to ask them. Okay, so if you will have questions in the future about security, uh, okay, we have one question I think uh, again about secure boot, Pranas. Uh, while Secure Boot does hardware checks, the codes of the built-in that they are safe and agreed code, and they are checking in the name of the file that are built in program. Um, I have to 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 
concentrated this in this question more deeply, I believe, because I want to understand what exactly it is. And we will answer this question in, in our Q&A session, which we upload to go with a webinar in our webpage. Yeah, I, th I think it would be the best if we would check it again and uh, for 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 uh, the person who asked this question, uh, I hope uh, to get an explained uh, question, let's say, uh, via email or LinkedIn message to me, Pranas or David, uh, just write this question again uh, and then we will answer that. Okay, we have a question about secure boot and I think it's the last question. So so secure boot is default for all other X series devices by default, but we can still use SDK and custom firmware, is it? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, secure boot is like a hardware additional feature and it is uh, possible only on two, uh, let's say codes, two products, uh, RT950, 955, but with specific codes, uh, meaning that there are only two products and that are supporting secure boot. Other products like X series, TRB series, RT3 series, they do not support secure boot. Only 950 and 955. Okay, so uh, we do not have any additional questions. So thank you uh, for joining this webinar. I hope to see you in the future webinars. And the next webinar, which we'll, we will have, is about uh, RMS VPN remote management system VPN. So do not forget to register because it's a new feature which uh, I think will uh, rock the market uh, in the software market. Uh, and again, thank you everyone. Thanks Pranas, thanks David for joining and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye, appreciate your time.